Hey, Ron. I feel it up. Yeah. Um, welcome to the 18th Paris Love Meetup. Uh, yeah. Uh, James here is one of the co organizers, and he's doing his second talk uh, for the meetup. Uh, I posted the event late, so we don't have as many people as we usually do, but thank you all for coming. You're awesome. Um, There's more of my fault. Well, it's James. Uh, I'm going to turn this down a little bit more. He wasn't kidding. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk about this paper uh, written, written, or at least I'm going to talk about this paper that was published in 1964. Uh, it's by Peter Landon. Um, it's called The Mechanical Evaluation of Expressions. And it's basically um, a description of an abstract machine that can uh, evaluate expressions of the lambda calculus. It's the, it's the first abstract machine to be described to do this. Um, it, uh, it, this paper came uh, just a couple years after uh, McCarthy developed LISP, uh, John McCarthy. Um, and so uh, basically the landscape was that uh, there was LISP, which was this uh, uh, really interesting programming uh, environment that John McCarthy came up with. Um, and there was uh, the lambda calculus, which had come before, uh, which Alonzo Church uh, developed and didn't really have any, uh, as, as far as I can tell, uh, Church didn't, didn't, wasn't thinking about it being implemented in a computer. He, he, was, he developed the lambda calculus as its own, just uh, kind of pure mathematics thing. Um, and, uh, what Landon does in this paper is basically say, uh, okay, here's, I'm going to describe a machine that could evaluate the lambda calculus. And he, he does this, and in so doing, he kind of ties together um, the, uh, the world of programming languages and the world of the lambda calculus. Uh, I'm, a little, I'm a little unclear exactly on, like, you know, how how, what, what the relationship is between, um, between the, uh, the way that he ties it together here and the way that, you know, John McCarthy seems to have tied it together with implementing LISP, um, you know, but, but that's, that's something that, uh, I've seen people say in different places that this was kind of like, uh, a pioneering, uh, paper in, in that, in that bridge between the two worlds. Um, so the paper, um, one of the things about the paper is it, it kind of, there, it's similar to a lot of papers where um, it's talking about the implementation of uh, programming languages or, or similar things uh, in that the, it kind of switches back and forth between um, between two different kinds of language. So, uh, so most of the language that you see in the paper is the language that Landon uses to um, describe the workings of the machine. Uh, but there's also the language that it's supposed to be evaluating, which is the language of the lambda calculus. Um, and so uh, this is one of the things that uh, was a little bit too confusing for me at, at first, so I'll try to make it clear as I go through things for you. Uh, but basically, you know, he, a, a, lot of the, a lot of the work in the paper is kind of building up the language that he uses to describe the machine itself. Uh, the land and calculus is kind of already taken as a given. Um, uh, although he does uh, kind of go into a lot of uh, 
fundamental concepts uh, and, and uh, building up really basic concepts uh, uh, to be used in the, in the machine itself. Um, so what I'm, what, what I'm going to do in this presentation is kind of go through some of the uh, highlights, let's say, or, or some of the really key points in the paper. Um, I'm going to be leaving uh, a fair bit out uh, of the discussion, but we can uh, maybe cover some of that in Q&A. Uh, and then um, I've done an implementation of this machine um, that I'll, I'll, I can show you working, and uh, uh, so I'll try to kind of tie together what, how the paper describes it, and then how at least one way that that could be implemented in uh, in code today. So um, one of the first things Landon does is, uh, you know, he, he covers what a lambda ex, uh, a lambda expression is. Yeah, Dan. Uh, do you have the volume it here it's this lambda symbol uh, and then the bound variable or bound variables and then a dot and then the body so you know uh, what you should be thinking of here and uh, here's a, an example of one so um, so this is like a function uh, we are declaring a function here so uh, the lambda says this is a function, and then, uh, at least in this form of the lambda calculus that he's talking about, you're allowed to have lists of arguments and not just one argument. Um, so here we have three arguments, uh, a, b, and f. So this this lambda expression says um, I expect arguments a, b, and f, and what I'm going to return is uh, the result of calling uh, f which should be some other lambda expression or function with a plus b and a minus b and then add that to f applied to a minus b and then a plus b. So it's just an arbitrary kind of bit of arithmetic but, uh, but it's interesting uh, because it's, um, it, it shows a few things. One is, at least in this uh, version of the lambda calculus that he's talking about, uh, you know, you can have these um, these operators uh, that are arithmetic operators. Uh, you know, in in uh, in more basic versions of the lambda calculus, you don't even have numbers, right? So um, so this is uh, this is a little bit easier to to deal with. You don't you don't have to only ever be working with uh, lambda expressions. Um, and uh, it's interesting also because uh, it's a higher order function. So uh, this function that's being declared, um, the first two arguments are uh, numbers, or at least uh, it would only work if they're numbers that can be added and subtracted. Uh, but then the third argument is itself a function. So um, functions are, uh, are values. The, the lambda expressions themselves are values like any other that can be um, passed as arguments to other lambda functions. Um, so this is this is the kind of thing that Church was describing in uh, in his work. Uh, and uh, James, yeah, sorry, uh, uh, just I think a point to go back to the previous slide. Yeah, um, just when you describe lambda calculus, right? It was based on very so basic primitives. 
there was no such thing as numbers or data types or things like that. Right. Essentially encoded those that are not a function. Everything was essentially a black box construct in the yeah. black application. Right. Uh, so in this case, plus would be a different lambda construct. And this would be syntactic sugar for saying for the lambda construct that we know, which is which is plus, feed in the arguments, apply it to A and B. And F right. could also be a lambda construct and things like that. So I think there's a fair amount of syntactic sugar going on, which may be important for people to realize if they ever get curious and start digging into lambda calculus and like what the hell is going on there. Yeah, yeah, right. So yeah, I just kind of uh, touched on that, but it's a good thing to it's a good thing to um, to make clear is that uh, the lens calculus that the church described, uh, you know, was really really just lambda expressions working on other lambda expressions. Um, uh, in this paper, though, it's a little bit. I mean, uh, maybe someone, maybe you or someone else can correct me, but. Um, at least it was a little unclear to me with this paper um, how whether or not the operators like this were if Landon was considering them as syntactic sugar for operations on church numerals or if if it's um, he, he does introduce this concept of basic functions that are kind of like primitive functions that we would be built into the machine. Uh, so uh, I, I think at least uh, what you'll see later is, um, with my implementation at least, is that uh, you can, um, the, the way that the machine is built, it's left open to uh, have basic functions that can, can have arithmetic like this built right. into the machine. And I think one perspective of this is my interpretation when I was reading this, I was coming through this rather, was uh, this was influenced by the list and it's in the same sort of family and this is uh, all of the going about it and then we look at this, it definitely drew inspiration from Lambda Calculus and the okay. Heat and things like that, but it, it wasn't a pure mathematical or just when it was designing it, Here they're looking at programming languages, and for that it's useful uh, once you've proven that lambda constructs are enough to import or to make a you actually have a new Right. Right. Um, yeah. So, uh, so I think this is looking at it from a real language perspective, and I think like, considering it, leaving it at the level of you know this is equivalent to list, and if you leave it at this, it's okay. But if you still think you're actually trying to lambda calculus, the connection is as strong or weak as it is. That's that's a good point. Um, so uh, so one of the things that Landon um, digs into, and that this becomes kind of a recurring theme, he refers back to these three questions a fair bit in the paper. Uh, these are the three questions that you should be able to um, ask about. Uh, an abst or, excuse me, an applicative expression, which is um, uh, which is one of these uh, building blocks of, of the lambda calculus. So, um, question one: Is it an identifier? If so, what identifier? So, here, you know, the identifiers are A, B, F. Right? Um, is it a lambda expression? If so. What identifier or identifiers constitute its bound variable part, and in what arrangement, uh, and then what constitutes its lambda body? So, the ABF uh, are the bound variables, and then everything after the period here is the body uh, of the of the lambda expression. Uh, so those are those are the questions that we can ask about lambda expressions, um, and then. The third option for an applicative expression is, is it an operator operand combination? If so, what is the expression constituting its operator? What is the expression constituting its operand? So in this example, uh, the, so in A plus B, this is a, an expression here. Um, and so here plus is the 
uh, operator and a plus b theta are the upper ends. Um, it, for this whole expression, uh, f is the operator and a plus b is one upper end and a minus b is the other upper end. Um, so, so those are those are the building blocks of the lambda calculus. And uh, so the paper kind of refers back to these questions every so often uh, in, in discussing how we can implement this in, in the machine. Um, uh, another thing he talks about are predicates, selectors, and constructors. These apply really to the, this is when he starts talking about, uh, starts using the language that he uses to describe the machine. So um, w when he talks about like how you represent a lambda expression, how you represent a an identifier, uh, uh, gets into closures and, uh, and environments and all the rest. So uh, all of these things require um, some memory in a computer. They require some structured, uh, you know, some it, it's structured data that uh, that can be operated on in certain ways. Uh, so, you know, he talks about how uh, with predicates you can ask questions about this data. So you can say, is this an identifier? Is this a lambda expression? Uh, um, uh, selectors let you uh, basically look at particular pieces of these data structures. So for your representation of a lambda expression, it has this bound variable part where you can, so, so there's a selector to find out what are the bound variables of a lambda expression. Um, and then constructors let, lets you build these different data structure structures. So, you know, this is just some terminology that he uses throughout the paper. Um, and uh, so he has these structure definitions that, um, that talk about uh, basically, you know, what do these data structures look like that we're using to represent these different things and, and what are the predicates and selectors and constructors that we can use with them. So this kind of description appears a few times throughout the paper describing the different uh, representations that we can use. Um, so here's he's describing an AE or applicative expression. Uh, so, and you can see here, this corresponds to the three questions from earlier. So an AE is either an identifier or it's a lambda expression or it's a combination where you're applying a function to an argument. Um, so a lambda expression has these different parts. So uh, then he reuses, so this BV here, he reuses throughout the paper whenever he wants to get at the bound variable of a, of a lambda expression. Uh, and similarly with the body of a lambda expression. Um, and you know, a combination of two things when you're applying a function, uh, it has an operator and an operand, uh, both of which could be any of these things. So you know, if you've if you've bound if you've bound some identifier to refer to some function, then you can uh, this operator might be an identifier referring to that function, or it might be a lambda expression itself if you're just uh, you know writing writing a lambda expression and then evaluating it immediately. Um, uh, or it could itself be a combination uh, and the result of which is going to, when evaluated, uh, is going to give you the function to be applied. Um, talks about lists, pretty simple. It's a singly linked list as appears in Lisp. Um, so, yeah, so lists are, are really, the, this is an example of a data structure which, uh, you know, it's not a native element of the lambda calculus, but it's a data structure that's needed for the machine. So, um, so, he, so he describes it here, and uh, uh, one, thing, one thing that uh, was 
confusing for me at first when I was first skimming the paper was I kept on seeing like lowercase h and then something else, and I I kept on, I thought it was like a new variable that I kept on not finding where it was defined. Uh, but in this paper, Landon really likes just uh, uh, you know having the name of a function right up against its arguments. So you know h capital C is really like the head function with C as its operand. So that was confusing for me at first. Um, so whenever you see lowercase h or lowercase t and then something else, uh, usually with a, an uppercase letter, uh, it's, you're getting the head or tail on the list. Um, so this is where he gets into like how you take a, an applicative expression and figure out the value that it evaluates to. Uh, so this is like this is the a, a very high level description of the um, of the the main kind of thing that the machine is doing. Uh, you know, as you'll see, um, the, when you have a working impl implementation of the machine, uh, you you start with basically the machine is given some single expression of the lambda calculus, and uh, you basically iteratively transform that expression through these rules um, to find out the value of that expression. Uh, so if x is an identifier, then the value of, um, so e here is the environment of that the expression is being evaluated in. So if x is an identifier, then the value given environment e of x is ex. This is another kind of, took me a while to find a place where he defines this, but uh, whenever he talks about environments, um, the environment itself is considered to be a function that you can uh, you can give it an operand of some uh, identifier and and then get out the value uh, that is held in that environment. So um, so maybe it's useful if I just go back here. So when we evaluate this lambda expression. Uh, at some point, when this, when the body of this expression is being um, is being evaluated, let's say we have this we have this function here, and let's say we actually apply these arguments to it. So we have, you know, let's say we apply it with the arguments one, two, and then you know f could be multiplication, for example. Uh, so. In this case, once we're evaluating um, the body of this, um, uh, then it, in that environment, the environment would be uh, a list of pairs of um, identifiers like this, along with the values that those identifiers refer to. So A would be associated with one, B with two, F with the multiplication function. Um, so that's that's what an environment is. You'll you'll see that in more detail in a little bit. Um, R two is on the next slide. Rule three is if x is a combination, then the value given environment E of x can be found by first subjecting both its operator and operand to um, val E. Val e being itself like a function which tells you the value of something given the environment e, um, and then applying the result of the former to the <laughs> to the result of the latter. So um, all that's saying is you evaluate the um, whatever is in the operator place of the combination. You evaluate that fully first, and then you evaluate whatever's in the operand position, 
using these rules, the same rules, uh, and then you apply um, uh, the like that operator value to the operand. Um, so R2 would be left until a little further down because it's so big. Um, and this is what covers lambda expressions. And the reason it's so big is because he talks about these environments and how you build up environments. So what's going on in the machine is that, um, you know, you might be more familiar with, uh, uh, well, call stacks, right? Um, I mean, this is, this is a call stack that the machine is implementing. It's, um, uh, once it goes into the evaluation of uh, a, a lambda expression applied to some arguments, um, once it enters into that function, uh, it's gonna, like, the arguments of the function uh, get bound to those values as I described before. Um, and this is just describing how, you know, we had an environment before, which was this list of key value pairs. And when we are evaluating the body of the function, uh, it's just that environment that we had before plus the new pairs that we get by um, associating the values of the operands with the arguments. And this is this is the this is what he <laughs> uses to show this. Um, it's a bit weird because uh, he he says like, okay, the new environment like. He describes how, you know, he describes in English how that works. So you have a new environment that is the old environment plus some new stuff. Uh, and then he says, this is how I denote the new environment. I derive it from, okay, so from this association of things with the old environment. So derive is a function that takes two arguments. The second is the old environment. The first, it, it, this is the weird thing, he never really talks about a SOS itself. He just kind of lets it, he lets you just infer that, what it means. Uh, yeah? Did you have a question? Yeah, sorry, does he explain why sometimes the two arguments are separated and for sometimes it's just yeah, so there's this one part in the paper where he basically says, like, uh, I will use all of these different ways of doing this, and uh, you can figure it out, basically. <laughs> so sometimes he, you know, it, this is another thing, so the different kinds of brackets that he uses, sometimes he uses regular parens, sometimes he uses curly braces, square brackets, they're all the same. It's, it's just like in... Uh, grade school math where you can just use whatever brackets you want uh, and you switch them out just to be clear, right? Um, so all, the brackets always mean the same thing. Uh, basically, brackets are to make things clear when they aren't, wouldn't be otherwise. Um, but he, he, a lot of the time he just leaves them out and, uh, and he says, you know, it should be clear. Um, but in this case, the BVX, so uh, BV is the selector that gives you the bound variables of a lambda expression. So here, uh, just to make this concrete, so, um, so this is getting the new environment uh, like from a particular uh, lambda expression. So, um, sorry, given the, excuse me, um, this is given the, the bound variables of the lambda expression, and then lowercase x here is the um, the value or values that are going to be associated with that bound variable or variables. 
Okay. On the previous slide, you had a lambda expression with an x of lambda. I think it was like r squared plus x squared or something. So if we have, for yeah. example, our, our lambda expression is lambda of k, uh, lambda of r is 3 plus r, let's say. Then if we did a soc of bb of that lambda and pass in 3 as our second part, what did I say? Like, what was it? 5 plus? Five plus x for our lambda. And then we did a sock bb, that lambda expression, comma, three. And we get eight back out of that. Uh, so if you have a lambda taking x and returning uh, five plus x, yeah. and then, okay, and then, then in here when you plug the, that in, the, because the lambda is taking x, then this would be the identifier x. And this would be five, and then ASOC. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Excuse, excuse me. I'm sorry. It was x plus five. Uh, the plus five is irrelevant here. Um, the the wh whichever value you are giving to that function at the moment uh, gets put here. So if you supply it with three x is bound to 3, which means this function takes the identifier x and 3, okay? And it returns something, which he doesn't see, I, as far as I can tell, he doesn't, he doesn't really describe in detail. We haven't evaluated No, all this is doing is calculating what the environment of the closure is going to be. So, uh, Again, that's something that you'll see in more detail in a bit, but when we are actually evaluating the application of a lambda expression to uh, some operand, uh, we have to turn that lambda expression into a closure. Uh, or if we, um, well, basically whenever we evaluate a lambda expression, we need to turn it into a closure, which involves taking its, uh, the environment that it was defined in, and then whenever that closure is called with um, operands, then this is going to be done on the base environment to figure out the new environment. So in, in modern terms, we can think of our capital E as being a map of key value pairs. And this statement is a fancy way of saying within E, x is going to equal 3, modulo variable shot. Yes, so within, not E, but the thing that it's returning. Yeah, yeah. E prime or whatever, yeah. So what does this OS look like if you had multiple down variables? So this is something that um, I, there was a number of things like this that uh, I struggled with when I did the implementation because it's it wasn't very clear to me, but the way that I did it is, and because this is, as far as I can tell, the way that I interpreted what Landon was saying is that this is really, it's like, this is either going to be one argument or a list of arguments, and they're treated as distinct cases. And X would be the same thing. Yeah, so, so X, X could be any value, but one kind of value is a list of values. Right. So the way that I interpret what Landon is saying here is if you have if you have the, this lambda expression, the way that you call this, because it expects a list of arguments, you'd actually call it with a list data structure of two integers and a function taking two integers. Makes sense. Okay, so that's how you get new environments, or at least that's the, you know, the code that he's saying he's going to use for deriving new environments. 
Um, and then this is kind of the formalism that he writes out for, uh, you know, as a formalism of these rules. So the way that you get the value of x in a certain environment is if it's an identifier, then you just look it up. If it's a lambda expression, then you um, do the you drive the new environment, um, and then you uh, and then you run this same thing. Uh, so. You drive the new you you drive the new environment and then you run val which is this whole thing so recursive um, you run val on the new environment with the body expression uh, that gives you um, uh, yeah this is. So this is kind of funny. So this is defining a function f, which takes a, an argument x, um, and that's what it's returning here. Uh, it's a bit confusing because you know it looks like val e x is the value that you get back, but here it kind of seems like this must be. Oh yeah, no, that, that makes sense. So, um, okay, so <laughs> to figure out the value of a lambda expression, you have to, uh, so the value of a lambda expression is a function which, when run with an argument, performs this value operation using the, um, New environment with the body expression, um, and then otherwise it must be a combination because that's the only other thing that's allowed. And then what we're doing is it's another recursive operation where we uh, have to get we look up the value of the operator. He likes he likes calling <laughs> he doesn't he doesn't like the OPE so he calls it rater and ran instead of operator and operand. Um, so, value of an environment E of uh, the operator of uh, the combination, X here is the, the combination of two things. Um, and then that is hopefully going to give you one of these Fs, because hopefully you're only using a function in the operator position. And then you apply it to whatever the operand evaluates to. So the things on the left-hand side of the arrow are copies of the things on the right-hand Yes. Yeah, so this, right. Yeah, so that's exactly right. The things on the left are patterns. Or actually, it's really just a, a, like a case statement or if statement. It, it's a it's an it's an if else if else construct, and identifier is one of the predicates that he talked about, um, and lambda x is another predicate. So you can ask if uh, some applicative expression or AE. You can ask if it's an identifier. You can ask if it's a lambda expression. Yeah. Um, and then here's where he talks about. Location. There's a couple things that really I, I still haven't figured out about this. Uh, I find it a little bit weird. Um, basically, the way he describes it here is apparently that location e star x e star is the same as val e x. So apparently, this is the same as evaluating. Uh, but later on, it really seems like all this is is looking up in the environment without doing anything else. So I don't really know. I don't really know why it's like that. Uh, maybe maybe someone can tell me. Um, another weird thing is that he. So the thing with the here he says like. Uh, 
after all this, we shall not bother below to distinguish between E and E star. I think what's all that's going on there is that he's using E star to talk about the data structure specifically in memory that represents the environment, and then E is the abstract environment. So it, this is one of those cases where it's like it kind of feels like he's he's like switching worlds whenever he wants to. So it's a little bit hard to keep track of, but um, you know the the whole paper. I mean, he says at the beginning of the paper like this is basically he says it's a it's a sketch. He's keeping things loose, so uh, it's it's definitely forgivable, but it's a, a little bit hard to know uh, sometimes what's going on. It's forgivable to do the interchange, but it's things like X is a uh, third shelf from the bottom on the right, and you go into any room to find a third shelf from the bottom on the right. That's right. Oh, are you talking about like? That's what a location is. So it's a reusable pattern. Right. Okay. So, yeah. So I guess it's like. So location. So that's why it's it takes the second E star there basically. So it's like location E X gives you a function which will look up x in E star. And then you give it E star later if you want, and then it'll give you the value of x in E star. Um, so it, that's that's kind of what you're saying there? Like, it gives you a reusable thing? There, there's a slight difference between an E and an E star. The E okay. star is a thing for which this makes sense, and E is the more general. Oh, OK. So an e, so you're saying that an E star is yeah. So you're saying E star um, E star is any environment for which the same operation would give you the value of the same uh, identifier. For which the X operator would make sense. Well, if so any environment with X in it. Where the X thing makes sense. The description oh. of X, right? So if you're talking about X as a bound variable, whatever be the case, if we if we look at X really as being a description of how to get at a location, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and if you're talking about just lambda calculus itself, is it the second argument? Is it the uh, within that lambda body? Is it the third one or fourth one? Or however it needs to go, that only makes sense for certain structures. Okay. So it makes sense. That's the stuff. Okay. E star is always an environment, though. Sorry. Yeah, so another good thing about locations is things like third argument, which only makes sense for functions that have at least three. Right. Right. Okay. But E star is always an environment, though, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll have to talk with both of you later about that to fully understand that. But that's that's good to hear. Um, Okay, so uh, so then he talks about the whole state of the machine. So um, I don't even know if I've mentioned the name of the machine yet, but it's very important. It's the SECD machine, um, and uh, uh, it's if you look it up, you can find all sorts of things about SECD machines, um, and people have made all kinds of variants on SECD machines. Uh, but here, here's the original. So um, there's a stack, there's an environment, there's a control, and there's a dump. Um, the stack is a list of values. So those are like runtime values, and eventually, once the machine finishes running, it'll be the final value in there. Um, the environment is that list of named value pairs. Uh, the control is um, uh, it's your list of instructions, um, and you would typically init initialize uh, a, a machine state where the control has a single uh, AE in it. So it has a single applicative expression um, in it. Uh, and then the dump um, is a place to put uh, some some other full state of the machine, and um, uh, so you, you end up with 
you know, there's, there's some, every state of the machine, well, it, you begin with nothing there, but, um, uh, but once it starts running, uh, there's basically whenever you, um, there's, there's like one or two times when you put something in the dump spot. And uh, it, it, it kind of implements your call stack. So, um, so when you are evaluating, when, you, when you've uh, uh, done that, derive the new environment like, like I showed before, um, and you're evaluating the body of a lambda expression, uh, the state of the machine would have a dump that would be um, like the previous state of the machine with the old environment and the, uh, um, uh, well, it's the old environment, but it's not, it doesn't have the last instruction in it. it you'll see that in a minute. Basically, it's, it's your, it, it implements your call stack, more or less. Um, okay, so here is then the, the formalization of the transform function, which takes one state of the machine and turns it into the next state. So this is, this is like, um, this uses, uh, you know, there's a number of things here that I haven't talked about that he, he, he defines in the paper, uh, but it's fairly straightforward. Um, this is, this part is like, uh, takes that, definition of value x and reworks it into uh, something a bit different um, uh, that, that involves the, the whole state of the machine. Um, uh, but basically what's going on is, okay, so if, so null c means if there is uh, nothing, if there are no instructions left, then uh, take, so take the dump, take whatever's in the dump, and um, return that, except that we want to take the current head of the stack and put it on the, uh, put it at the beginning of the stack that's in the dump. Uh, so the, the reasons why we would be doing these things, I'm gonna really gloss over just to get through it, and then I'll show you in the implementation like why this would be a good thing to do. <laughs> um, uh, if, if we don't, if we do have something in the control uh, in, in this sequence of instructions, um, then we look at, uh, so x here, this is, you may miss this, but x is the head of the control. So we take the first element of the control list, if there is anything there to get, um, and we say, here again we see like the echo of those three questions. So. Is it, is it an identifier? Is it a lambda expression? Or um, actually, this is the combination one, and this is something else. So um, if it's an identifier, then look up the, the value that that should refer to and uh, put it at the beginning of the stack. Okay? So if if the, if the control, think about a machine that only had a control with one value in it, so it just has like one identifier, A. If that's all there is in the, if, if that's the expression that you're evaluating, just an identifier, A, then uh, all you need to do is um, like, uh, do, like figure out if, a is in the environment that's there. Uh, so this is something that, again, I was kind of unclear on, like, should this only look in the environment or should it do anything else? Uh, but anyway, 
it's, uh, it's going to look it up in the environment and maybe do something else. Uh, figure out what, what I should put on the stack from A. Uh, maybe it's just an atom called A. Okay? So if that's all there is, then it's just going to say uh, replace the control with um, the tail of control, meaning I've already consumed A from it. I, I'm going to leave the rest for the next iteration. And I'm going to figure out the, the value that I want A to be and put that on the stack. And then if that's all there is, then we would just end up with A on the stack and we'd be done. Um, if it's a lambda expression, we make a closure out of it, uh, saving the current environment and the bound variables of the lambda expression, and then uh, also extracting the body of the lambda expression. Uh, put that closure on the stack. So closure is another kind of value that corresponds to the expression of the lambda expression. Um, again, we, we only keep the tail of the control list uh, because we've already consumed that instruction. Um, AP here is, uh, is means like apply, and it's basically like, as we're kind of uh, churning through these uh, expressions, um, whenever we have, uh, uh, whenever we have um, a combination, like uh, whenever, whenever we're applying a function to an operand, uh, it's gonna end up like putting a closure on the stack after it puts the operands on the stack. So you end up with a stack that has like um, uh, the operands, the operand, and then the closure that it's going to be called on it. But then after it does that, you put an AP here, all that stuff is here. So um, the AP means uh, look at the head of the stack, if it's a closure, then run the closure on like the derived environment that's appropriate. Um, and, uh, and the way that you run that closure is by, by like uh, storing the, um, the rest of the control that you currently want to remember in the dump. But then the new control of the new like machine state should be uh, the so the control part of the closure, which is the body. So the um, the so the, the lambda expression has a body, which is itself an uh, an expression of some kind, and uh, so more precisely that that is a list where, this, where the one element is um, the body of the, of the lambda expression. And that becomes the only thing that is to be evaluated until, uh, until it's consumed and we go back to the dump, basically. Um, uh, this else here is um, this is I, as far as I can tell this is for uh, the implementation of basic functions so um, if we if we want to have a built-in function uh, like plus or minus then that needs to be that needs to be this is where this is going to get run so um, when we when we look at when we look up uh, plus in the environment, we're not going to find anything. Uh, but at some point, we might want to say, well, it's, it, you know, it wasn't introduced into the environment, but it's a built-in function. So uh, what's going to end up on the stack is not a closure, but rather one of these built-in functions. Uh, and here, this is just saying like. Well, if it's not a closure, it must be a built-in function if we're applying it. Uh, 
So we're going to call that built-in function with whatever the second thing on the stack is. Yeah? Sorry, when closure comes comes back with one? So when you already give you only give you create a new let's just see this only the code. Yeah, so oh, okay. So maybe this is what you're talking about. There's what I believe to be a couple typos in here, actually. Uh, so one of them I was just about to get to. So that's a C prime. So this should be C prime. Yeah, uh, so thank you for asking that. Okay, so um, so as far as I can tell, this is a typo. It should be C prime, otherwise it wouldn't be used anywhere, and it makes sense. So, um, uh, so this is the, the new state that it returns has the control list as a list with a single element, which is the body expression of the lambda expression. Um, the one other typo, which I believe is a typo, this? Oh, yeah, right. That's the other one. Okay, so three typos, I think. Um, so, yeah, this should be second to S. Okay. And then the other one is this one, which I'm a little less sure about, but as far as I can tell, if everything else works the way that it does, then you have to have the operator at the top of the stack, not the operand. So, um, uh, because here, sorry? You apply the second to the first, so think this is leading is actually the operator as opposed to operator. Yeah. Well, um, in this part, we're, yeah, so, so here, like, the, it, yeah, exactly. So here, we, we're applying the second to the first, and similarly here, um, you know, this is a, asking if the head of the stack is a closure, meaning, you know, what should be here. Here, it's saying randex, which would actually be, um, well, the operand. Right, so that would not be the closure. Well, this is this is the closure that you that you want. So, um, so it seems like the order of these is actually uh, reversed as well. Um, and I found that out by running my implementation, which you'll see in a second. And I got an error, which uh, which <laughs> told me that I couldn't use one as a function, so. Um, okay, so, so that's, that's that. I'm, gonna, I'm about to get into the implementation that I did. Uh, is there anything, any questions so far? It'll become more clear, I think, with, uh, with the running code, um, but any questions? So, um, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'll, I'll show you it running first, and, and then uh, I'll, I'll run it with a few examples, and, and then I'll just kind of show you a few things about the implementation, otherwise it'll probably take too long. Um, uh, so here is, here, here is a, an implementation of the SCCD machine in Elm, which is a language which compiles to JavaScript, it's running in the browser, um, and there's a very uh, primitive uh, uh, 
visualization of the SCCD machine here. Uh, it's basically just um, telling you in a very <laughs> primitive way what's what's in there. Uh, but here we can see that uh, our, our initial state has uh, empty stack, empty environment. The control has a single applicative expression, which just has the identifier hello world in it. Um, and uh, there's no dump. So let's see what happens when we step forward. Okay, boom. This is like that first path that I showed where there was nothing to do except just turn it into an atom. So it didn't exist in the environment. It wasn't a primitive operation. Uh, so we're just going to turn it into an atom. And I can't step forward anymore. Um, so that's Hello World. Uh, so here's. Here's something slightly more complex. Um, so here is, we have the same identifier hello world, but it is the operand of the identity function. So here we have um, an applicative expression with a combination, aka a function application, of a lambda expression which takes a single variable x and returns the identifier x, uh, which you can, which will get its value from the operand. And we're, we're taking that lambda expression and we're going to call it with the hello world identifier. So what happens then? Uh, we step forward once, and one of the rules of that transform function is if there's a combination, we should um, basically replace it with uh, uh, the AP um, instruction, so that's the apply instruction, and then the next thing should be the, uh, the operator, and then the next thing should be the operand. Um, so everything is still just uh, expressions. So there's nothing on the stack yet. There's no values on the stack. Step it forward again. And then there's a rule in that transform function which says, uh, OK, well, the top of the stack was, um, was this identifier. And so the same thing that we did before when there was only that identifier, we do again this time. We're just going to put it on the stack. We step forward again, and that lambda expression gets turned into a closure. So here, we, the, the way to read this is, so this is the base environment of the closure. So that gets taken from here. So when it came time to put that closure on the stack, we looked at the environment. There was nothing there. So there's, that's an empty environment. Um, and then it saves, basically, the rest of the information from the lambda expression. So a closure is basically a lambda expression plus an environment. Step forward again, and what's happened is because there's a closure on the top of the stack, we're going to run that closure with uh, this atom as its operand. Uh, so Right now, it hasn't finished running that closure yet, but it's introduced a new environment. Um, so this environment has a single entry where x is bound to this atom. And we have this, uh, um, let's see. Right, x is bound to this atom. The control has the body of the lambda expression. And then the dump has um, basically the state that we are going to return to when we finish. App disappears from the control. I'm sorry? App disappears from the control. 
Yes, because because that's what we consumed to run the closure. Yeah, good point. Yeah. So app disappears. We in 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 doing so we uh, introduce X into the environment. The control is the body of the lambda expression that we had, uh, and the dump is like. Um, it's not quite what we are going to return to because we still need to have a return value, but it's it's what we're going to use as the basis for our next state. So when we step forward again, now the stack gets um, uh, oh yeah. So wait a minute. Um, Oh yeah. Okay. So, so we look at so we use the same rules as we always do. So right now all there is is an identifier x. So what we're gonna do is we look it up in the environment, and now unlike before, um, uh, this environment actually has x in it. So that x was bound to the Adam Hello world. So when we Evaluate identifier x now, we get the atom hello world on the stack. There's no more control left, so we take what was there in the dump, which was basically empty, and we take uh, what's on the stack right now and we put it on the stack from the dump. And then we're done. Any questions? Um, right. So, okay, so now I'll show you like um, some arithmetic. Uh, this is where it gets wild. Um, okay, so, so this is using, so I, I implemented two basic functions plus and minus, uh, so I'll show you them in action. Uh, if I hadn't implemented them, then all we'd be able to do was juggle atoms and lambda expressions, um, uh, which is pretty cool in and of itself. You can do a lot, but uh, it's nice when you can actually use plus and minus and numbers to do things. Um, so here is one plus two in the SCCD machine. So uh, the way I implemented plus is as um, a curried function. So th this this machine um, does. I, I haven't. I implemented it with the ability, like in Landon's paper, to take multiple arguments per function. But uh, um, but this this version just does one argument at a time. So uh, this means that plus is going, when you when you give the plus function an argument, it's going to give you back a function that uh, will add that argument to some other argument. So I have to do like two combinations then. Um, so combination plus and one uh, is the first we evaluate, we're going to evaluate that and then, uh, and then um, that resulting function is going to be combined with two. Uh, so I'm going to run through this one more quickly, but uh, uh, it's the same operations as before, but we can see a little bit more going on. So we are converting that combination into um, two uh, applicative expressions and uh, an app. Um, we, uh, we, the identifier 2 turns into atom 2. Um, uh, the next combination again turns into two AEs and an app. Uh, so we get the identifier one turned into an atom, and then plus gets turned into this basic function. Okay, um, and then we apply 
which is going to uh, work with basic functions just like closures, except now it's running Elm code instead of Lambda expressions. Um, and uh, so now this basic function is, you can think of this as uh, plus one. So uh, this is partially applied now. And then step forward again and it gets applied to the three. Um, and then here's the last example. So with plus and minus. Um, so this is uh, this is uh, it's hard to read. It's like uh, it's actually easier to read in, in the code that I used to construct it. Uh, so this is adding to arguments. So um, plus the subtract so the subtraction of eleven minus two is the first operand, and then the second operand is five. Uh, so you keep on stepping forward. So one interesting thing here is um, so we get the right answer. Uh, one interesting thing, though, is here there's never any dump. So the reason there's never any dump is that I'm only using basic functions and never using lambda expressions, and so I never have to. I, I'm using I'm using the host programming language to implement all of that stuff. I don't need to. So, so I can do the application of the basic function in one step instead of, I wouldn't be able to do it any other way because the basic function itself is opaque to the machine. It's, it's, a, it's supplied by the host and um, the machine has no idea how it works. It's just all the basic function does is replace one value with another in some weird way. <laughs> so, uh, so when you have when you have uh, you know these primitive functions like this, then you never end up using the the dump. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So I think I've been going for long enough, so I won't really get too much into the code itself. I uh, I'll put it up on GitHub. Um, I uh, I tried to. Um, Actually, so there was a Haskell implementation of this that I found, which uh, provided a lot of guidance. Uh, I deviated in a number of places from that, uh, but that was really helpful also in understanding the paper. I could kind of go back and forth and see um, uh, see how, how I might interpret some things. Um, uh, and basically, the, the meat of it is in this SCCD module. Um, I define a bunch of types. You know, th these are the different data structures that Landon is talking about, um, where he gives all those structure definitions. Um, so uh, there's a bunch of type definitions. Um, you know, a, a few like helper functions. Most of the constructor functions, I just use the, um, uh, the constructors that Elm provides here. Um, and then, oh, here's the stuff for implementing the basic functions that I did. And then the transform function is here, which um, I kind of, there's a few ways I could have done this. I ended up uh, just basically going point by point through the paper trying to do things in that order, but instead of having it as nested if statements, I have it as a flattened pattern match. So um, so here, you know, I check to see, uh, okay, in, in the case that the stack is not empty and the 
control list is empty and there is a dump, do this, that corresponds to Landon's first case. Um, and uh, I have some error messages which, because Landon's paper doesn't, Landon's paper assumes that you always have a valid machine, so I figured I'd put in some helpful error messages which were helpful to me as I developed this. Um, and yeah, it's basically, yeah, I tried to keep it like as close to what he described as possible. So I'll put that up on the other. And that's about it. Uh, final thoughts. Um, uh, this was, I, I picked this paper because I wanted to learn more about uh, virtual machines and uh, I was already kind of familiar with the lambda calculus and um, uh, this was a really good way of um, kind of getting more of a sense for how these things work and uh, um, and definitely implementing it was um, was a lot of fun and uh, really helped um, help me understand the paper better. So, uh, yeah. Any questions? Do you implement fun basic functions to behave more like closures? Do you mean in the sense that they would use a dump? Yeah. And um, in the case of like uh, the yes. Yeah, so, so right. I, I think I. Yeah. You you definitely could. So I'm I'm not sure exactly like what a good use case would be for that, but yeah, lots. Tons, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so okay. I think, uh, so, what you, okay, I'll, I'll just show you, like, how the, where, where the basic functions hook in. Um, uh, so, here I have, like, apply primitive to operand. Okay, so, so basically, there's this case where I've already checked to see if uh, if it's a closure that I'm applying, and if it's not, then I'm and then I assume it's a basic function, and I apply the operands to it. Um, so I have this basic function construct. So I, I added basic function as a kind of value and. Uh, what I do with it here is I, um, I the, the basic function data structure has a an Elm function associated with it, and I just and that function takes a value of of this kind and re returns a, uh, like possibly returns a value or possibly an error. Um, uh, so what you could do is you could do something like this, but hook it in anywhere in the machine. So I could have like, um, I could have a different kind of basic function that actually took in the whole state and then you'd be able to do whatever you wanted with the state. And uh, you know, you could imagine how that would be a very powerful thing that, uh, I mean, you know, maybe you can do continuations, or I don't, I don't know. Is that kind of what the kind of thing that you had in mind, or the, the comp COIS that operator will allow you to then form any general purpose argument to the actual memory functions? Con, if, if you implemented cons as uh, oh, I see. So to operate on the lambda expressions themselves, you're saying you'd have cons to operate as a basic function to return a closure. So the lambda functions could then consume it. Okay. Yes, yes, right. Yeah. Yes, okay, so, um, yeah, so if you, and actually, uh, 
Right, right. So that that's how. So when I started implementing the basic functions here, that's kind of how I started to do it, and then I ran into some. If I, I, I don't know. I, for some reason, I ended up doing it this way. But when I started to do it, it was that the basic function would return a um, like when you apply plus to some argument, then it would return a closure. Uh, I ended up doing it where it returns another basic function, uh, partially guided by like Landon in the paper says a basic function is you know anything any operator not included in the, in the environment or any function produced by a basic function. So I figured, well, I'll do it. That sounds like I should do it this way. But maybe there's some interesting advantages to, to returning closures instead of so that. Well, if you were going to be passing around function pointers instead of atoms, yeah, you're going to have to make them full-fledged closures to pass them around. Right, OK, yeah. yeah. But you, you, you hit that on the right paradigm, you put the right combination. In your syntax, yeah, that's constant. You need to do things. You need to do consistently for something you can work on. Right, right, yeah. And you, you end up with a thing which could be applied to other atoms, return atoms, or basic functions, but you didn't get a thing that could be applied to anything and return closures. That yes, exactly right, right. yeah. So what you're saying is that uh, basic function and return another combination that can be applied on? He did make basic functions return basic functions. Yes. But you can expand that with just a little bit more into you can apply it to anything and it returns a closure, which can now be used for anything and pass to anything. Right. Yeah. Would Yeah, right. Would what's the advantage of having a closure to pass around instead of a basic function? So that you can have a, say a, a function which takes two functions and does the cross product of them. Uh, okay. You're not going to be able to do that with graphics. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, cool. Uh, anything else? Okay. Thanks very much.